Welcome back to the Quiet On Set podcast powered by Cineman. I'm Young Graf, and as always, I'm joined by Mike Montili. On episode 155, it's been a big week if you're a Wes Anderson fan. It's a Wes Anderson fest, you could say, with four Ronald Dahl adaptations brought onto the big screen in short format. <laughs> That's right. It's also a big week if you are based in Zurich or Switzerland and you had the last 11 days to attend the Zurich Film Festival. It's over now and I'm also very done just with the festival but also just mentally and physically everything. I'm a bit I'm a bit sick as well. But I guess both of us are this week uh, but I got some highlights for you from the fest and then Lachlan and I both uh, finished the first season of Ahsoka. That's true. Ewan is suffering from fatigue and I've just got the worst case of hay fever ever so I sound like I'm sniffly and I've got like so many antihistamines pumping in my system right now. Hopefully it will make it better by the end of the recording. Yeah. Uh, but Exorcist Believer or The Exorcist Don't See Her. Is the latest Exorcist movie worth seeing? Well, uh, let's discuss that later in the episode and uh is it a good start to the spooky season it is october it is horror season i should say mm. uh with it being in that month of halloween exactly so let's cue up the intro and get into the show we are professionals this is, this is a professional podcast yes breaking bad and better for song hello there <laughs> which actually did you this get is me a hat a as bit... well um yes so i've got dune cam <laughs> It's just a camera <laughs> with my Dune steelbook. All right, uh, welcome back, uh, Lachlan. I hope you can deal with your hay fever. Uh, Hello. At least for the next oh, 60 minutes. It, it's been rough. I'm also slightly hungover as well, right. which is not a good mix. Yeah. Yeah, I had a big, big weekend, and now I'm suffering with this, and oh, mate, it is... It is a pain in the butt. I was um, at uh, the after party for the Zurich Film Festival and um, <laughs> I'm also a bit tired, but you might notice that there's no microphone in front of me. It might look a bit different. I, 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 I'm not wearing a V-neck. It's just that this microphone is kind of dragging it down. Uh, not trying to show you any cleavage here, but <laughs> yeah, uh, that's the situation. I'm, I'm having uh, some tech issues that have been in the background for the last couple of weeks. We are still looking for sponsors, by the way, if anyone wants to sponsor us, because I do need to replace my PC. It's becoming a bigger issue, but we'll have to deal with that in the background. Hopefully you won't notice it as much as far as the, the show goes, but uh, it's a nice kickoff point for the spooky season because I've just, this, this has been horror. Next to me here, this computer situation has been a horror. Um, and we didn't really look at the news this week. I think we were both really, really busy. And I don't think there's anything that jumped out to us, uh, something that we really want to discuss. No update on, on the strikes. So we, we are jumping straight into discussion time. We're skipping news. We're going to jump straight into it. And with the kickoff of October spooky season and later on our spoiler review for The Exorcist Believer, I do want to talk about the horror genre. And uh, like we've been doing for the past month we've with a variety of genres, where its state is at. Where, where do we see uh, the horror sphere right now in the 2020s? Um, and maybe also for upcoming movies. So, Lachlan, I know you're not the biggest horror fan. Like, you, you're not, like, deep into the genre. Maybe I'm, I'm a tad bit more into it, but I'm also not an aficionado for the, for the genre. But looking at uh, the past couple of films in the last three years, what, what do you think? Horror is going through its, uh, its weird phase where we are getting a lot of original ideas, but... At the moment, mm -hmm. we're still getting quite a lot of the spin-offs and sequels and reboots. So with uh, The Exorcist Believer, it's just one of many uh, horror reboots that have come back in recent years. Yeah. Uh, uh, the director's name of Exorcist, uh, David Gordon Green, is also the director of the Halloween reboot we've most recently had, yeah. which... To be fair, I've gone on the record saying that I actually don't mind the, the Halloween reboot. I thought it was actually really well done until you get to the final film and it's a little bit all over the place. But yeah. the initial Halloween reboot was was wicked. And going along that, when we talk about original horror, uh, X, Pearl. Pearl just came out on Netflix for me here in Australia. Mm -hmm. I'm super excited to watch that because X was... Uh, fantastic as like an original horror and in that slasher space where it feels like 
horror has been taken up by the, I guess the uh, supernatural more recently. Mm. Uh, would you would you say that as well? I feel like horror has mostly been supernatural uh, compared to the the gruesome horror gory side that like X or even something like, even though this is supernatural, but I do find Exorcist to be quite in the middle ground of gory and supernatural. I think this year, yeah, we also had uh, Evil Dead Rise as well. Um, we had Talk To Me just oh, more recently. Yeah. Uh, well, one yeah. original, one reboot or sequel, I should say. Again, it's, it's this weird balance with horror. It's like you get an original, you get a reboot. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, and I mean, What's different about, uh, what's his name, David Gordon Green or something like that, um, his films, they do get um, like the bigger budget, the bigger risk, when usually some of these uh, are actually like huge profit grosses. Like Saw X doesn't release for the two of us until I think November, but it has released in the States. And that's like, I think if you look at it, the most profitable franchise, it usually makes about 10.1 or 11.1 it's budget, which is crazy for a franchise. Uh, the return mm. on investment. Um, and it's not for every franchise that that is the case. But I wouldn't say there's a rise of Supernatural at the moment. I think it's also coined by by voices, people who are like uh, really into the space, like uh, Ty West, who, who does like his own trilogy of films here, or uh, the Rucka Rucka Boys, uh, Danny and Michael Phillip, who we've talked to me, who is gonna work on that further but i mean there's just a bunch of still pretty original feeling stuff in there like you could even include not last night in soho uh as technically a horror film bones and all with more of like a romance and he had megan earlier this year which was more based on the tech stuff uh i feel like we, we are getting a variety of horror films and i mean for most of the stuff that gets published it's smaller you, you wouldn't really hear about it but at least the Bigger ones, I feel like, have been more hits than misses, more than usual for, for the horror genre, in, in my opinion. So, I don't know. I'm, I'm pretty happy with where the, where the genre is at at the moment. Yeah, I guess the only two uh, original classic uh, horror icons uh, being Freddy and Jason, they're yet to have their, their reboot status uh, greenlit and, yeah. and, and out in the wild. Because... Uh, We've got we've got everybody else pretty much having a reboot, including uh, Candyman. Uh, but yeah. here we are with uh, without those two. Even uh, uh, Texas Chainsaw Massacre got its really shit reboot on Netflix, which is really similar um, to The Exorcist Believer, where it kind of just on the margins ties back a legacy character from the original into the main story for the reason of just marketing. Mm. Um, and I mean, even Scream, you could argue the latest Scream this year kind of did that with, uh, Gail Weathers, where she's like, even yeah. like, yeah, they are not doing a great job of kind of mixing new generation with the older one, uh, when it comes to horror franchises, but they insist on doing it. But if you look at Evil Dead Rise, for example, they don't do it that i think yeah yeah they don't do that so i don't know I, I just i prefer when they do its own thing but then it just is like this easy money grabbing genre you know where you can just like have uh, ellen burson be featured in the trailer and then well i guess still bomb at the box office but yeah there's also a lot of tr like not great stuff out there but i mean you can always just like I I ignore that stuff I, I guess it's like not culturally relevant enough that you can't escape it because it is still really niche. So I don't really mind when there's a bunch of flops or like not that well done films in the genre. I mean, you get even like other stuff like Nope uh, that you could uh, could consider, um, I, I, I guess, yeah, part of the horror genre. When you look into the, the some upcoming movies, is there anything that, that really excites you or... Yeah, I mean, for a bit of a slog when it comes to horror films. Well, of course, the, the Robert Eggers Nosferatu does intrigue me quite a bit. Yeah. Um, mainly from just a... Robert Eggers has proved himself to be a quite a capable film director. De de depending... Doesn't matter what the budget is. Mm. Doesn't matter what the, the story is. He, he always delivers. Even his most recent, The, the Northman, even though it, it wasn't as, in my opinion, great as his two previous films um the scale was something that he's never done before so he's got to learn with that and hopefully with Nosferatu he's learnt 
and you can make a great, great bigger scaled up uh, film. Uh, yeah, we got a bunch of <laughs> I, w- I would say vampire uh, films coming up, right? Go ahead. Does... Yeah, well, vampires are coming back, you know. <laughs> <laughs> vampires are in right now. Yeah, thanks to Olivia Rodrigo. But but for me, there's a lot of sequels in this list. Mm-hmm. Uh, Maxine, I'm excited for because it would be the end of the X trilogy. Again, I'm super excited to see Pearl. I just saw it came out on Netflix uh, today, and I've already uh, watch listed it, so I can I can get onto it. Yeah. Um, I I'll be very keen for that. But you've got things like A Quiet Place Day One. You've got Final Destination Six. I'm sure you're loving that. The yes. Conjuring, uh, Megan <laughs> Two. Definitely. Um. There's there's a lot of sequels in in play here. Yeah. Um. And and to be fair, re- reboots as well. I just said Nasperatu um as another one, but for me, there, there's not really any kind of original stuff that you can get excited for with horror because mm. you really don't know which way it's gonna go until it comes out. So I can't really say that I'm excited for uh you know what's what's an independent uh film here that, that I, I don't know anything wildwood um, is something. even lights out lights out too yeah sure yeah wildwood what don't even know what it's about yeah i mean either. i won't know anything until it actually comes out because i just can't horror can go to like so one way or the other when it comes to quality and that really just depends on who's backing the film and and overall the the the, the filmmaking uh, yeah style because i just don't think some filmmakers work for certain horror and mm. and, it's a, and a great example will be the exorcist today oh my gosh i'm slowly losing my voice <laughs> by the end of the podcast i'm not gonna have a voice um but a great example is i don't think david gordon green's filmmaking style works at all for the exorcist i think it works in extremely well for mm. halloween and i feel like he, he nailed that because in halloween it, it is violent it is it is hardcore where the exorcist while it is quite gory, The Exorcist plays a lot more into a psychological uh, manipulation of the characters, and we'll get into this shortly. Yeah. But um, mm. I'm not. I'm like I, as I said, I trust Robert Eggers with a Nosferatu, but I see another Nosferatu film here. Yeah. David Lee Fisher, who did a a remake of The Cabin of Dr. Calgary that I've never seen before, but I can see it's on Amazon Prime, mm-hmm. and um. Maybe I'll watch that, and if it's good, then it's then cool. He's just doing another <laughs> um, uh, reboot of a German expressionism film. <laughs> but yeah, hor- hor- horror is interesting, eh? It's uh, it's it's hard to pinpoint down to one thing because there's it is a niche, and then there's uh, dozens of of uh, niches to go down. Um, it's really just a yeah a rabbit hole that will uh, await you with a saw trap uh, by the by the end of at all if you, when you reach your bottom so, i'll yeah. tell you one horror film that i would say because you asked me like is there anything that's exciting for me there is one and it's return to silent hill um mm-hmm. yeah i i love silent hill not not the movies the games mm-hmm. uh, I, I have a little soft place in my heart for the actual movies i'll say that but i i would love to see a silent hill reboot or sequel where they really go into it and and they they adapt it well because mm. I, we've had this conversation with video game movies there's certain things you adapt there's certain things you don't pyramid head was like one of the best adapted things onto screen for those original silent hill uh films so yeah i I'd, I'd, I'd be in for a, a good silent hill but horror, horror is uh is making its wave into the into the mainstream again where it's it's back baby Mm-hmm. Like it didn't ever leave, but like it's back. I mean, coming in strong. Yeah, it it had its phase in the eighties with all of the slashers, and then the early two thousands was kind of um, really just with the rise of of Saw and the yearly new franchise entry uh, that just got continued by Paranormal Activity. I think it it was around that yeah. time where we got reboots and sequels, and it feels like. Um, maybe the movies that we are getting are not like that much better, but it, it's th- there's a bit of distance between them. It was like the initial hope that you maybe had for the Star Wars trilogy when like people thought the prequels were shit, and then we get this new trilogy and uh, all the possibilities, and then maybe they turn out to be like I don't know decent, and you like one of them, 
uh, or you, you might hate him as well. But like, especially with uh, a guy here, David Gordon Green, he is really set on making all of this like a continued thing with a trilogy. But we'll get into that in a second. Yeah, I think that's pretty much it. Let us know what you think of, of horror in the comments below. <laughs> Lachlan sneezing. And uh, let's get to what he's been up to, a uh, sneezy little hay fever boy. What have you been watching? So, in terms of for the, for the podcast this week, uh, I finished off Ahsoka, which we'll talk about shortly. Yes. I finished off the Wes Anderson shorts. Uh, last recording session we did, uh, the first one was out, and then mm. they brought out the other ones. Uh, was it every day for like a couple of days? Yeah, um, yeah. Wednesday to like Saturday not sure or something. How they, they yeah. Brought it out completely, but I watched those. I rewatched Talk to Me. Uh, oh, okay. Because my partner wanted to watch it. Wait, why? Um, she was interested. Ah, okay, okay. She, she didn't see it when it came out, and it came out. Uh, for mm. rent and on digital, so uh, we rented it uh, on Apple TV because it's the best way of watching anything if you're going to stream it. And it was okay for her; she didn't actually enjoy it that much, if I'm totally honest. Pretty much, her review was: uh, "Let's do less at the start and more at the end." She thinks it wraps up mm. too quickly, which, to be fair, yeah. on a rewatch, it kind of does once you know kind of what's going on. But your first watch, if you don't mm. know what's happening, it's actually pretty good. Uh, other than that, I have started watching One Piece, mm. uh, the the TV show on Netflix, the live action adaptation, and yeah. so far it's actually doing a pretty good job. I'm I'm having mm. a good time. Uh, where it, it's the a funny thing we're talking about adaptation and, and how you adapt certain things. Uh, it's adapting everything, and because everything is set in a reality where it's over the top, it all works. Mm. And that's the best part about this is that. It goes for being like, this world is insane and wacky and wild. Uh, and, and you will believe that. And you go, yeah. okay, cool. And it's more believable to see crazy, stupid shit happen on screen that just makes no sense for the world that it's set in. Yeah. Um, but because it goes hard into it, then it's perfect, right? Mm -hmm. So for me, uh, I can't wait to keep watching it. Uh, I'm probably going to continue once the recording's over. Because I'm about three episodes in, mm -hmm. uh, a couple more to go. I'll be very excited to see how the season finishes off. Yeah, I thought I could binge it as well, but then I noticed that like all of the episodes are like 50 minutes long or something. They're like, like an hour long, like yeah. they're decently long episodes, and I and I respect that. That's great. They pack a lot of it. I mean, the thing that I hear the most about the anime is that there's a lot of filler in there, like stuff that you can skip, and I feel like they nailed that here with the Netflix one where. There's not a lot of um, fat to trim. Um, and yeah, uh, just a huge audience for it that is hungry for more. Uh, anyways, that's all you've been watching. And I'm back from the Zurich Film Festival. We'll have a separate video where I go over all of the stuff. We'll have some guests featured, uh, some journalists who are working here in Switzerland who are going to share uh, their favorites as well. But that's a separate video that comes out later this week. But if I just uh, give you a quick, I guess, highlight, for some films that I rated like an 8 out of 10. Uh, yeah, 8 out of 10 for most of them. Um, and above, there wasn't too much. I honestly was uh, a bit, uh, I don't know, the wind got, uh, speaking of One Piece, it, it wasn't really in my sales anymore. Uh, I skipped a bunch of screenings. I was, I'm a bit let down by my performance because I had the possibility to, to like finish this festival with about 120 films watched from this selection. And I think I'm going, yeah, it's just, just crazy. It's just like, there's no reason Jeez. to do that. And uh, I didn't do it. No. Uh, I was just uh, going to focus on the stuff that I've already seen. And I took it, took it easy because the best stuff I had, fortunately, I guess, uh, already seen. And I didn't really rewatch re a ton of stuff. I rewatched Killers of the Flower Moon. And I did like it, I think, a bit more on the rewatch. But uh, we'll talk about that in two weeks when it releases uh, again. But um the documentary about uh, you, uh, the the Russian invasion into Ukraine in Mariupol, Twenty Days in Mariupol, uh, came out early this year in Sundance and um, had the premiere in Zurich as well. And that was just like a really harrowing documentary, just seeing like the effect of civilians, the the, the effect that uh, it has on civilians, and just like the 
uh, lying from the government in in Russia uh, about like the, the the footage that came out of it, and basically follow the Associated Press that are stationed there and trying to um, bring out the footage uh, to highlight what's what's happening. And there's a lot of death. There's a lot of like children that you see die, and it's just like a harrowing experience to just witness. But it feels like you definitely do have to witness. It in in a way, and it was really weird to be in a public screening for this one. Uh, I don't think they had a press screening for this, and it's just like customary, I guess, to have popcorn in in theater. I I never do it. I don't I don't really like snacks when I'm when I'm watching a movie. But I mean, it's no a normal thing. But it's really weird when someone in the row behind you is like munching on, on popcorn and and you see like a baby die five seconds later. It's it's so odd. But it's, it's a, it was a really weird viewing experience, but I think it's going to be one that's it's got definitely going to be Oscar nominated. So uh, later in the year, early next year, uh, a lot of people should catch up on it once you can. Um, it's worth watching. Another doc on a political, politically influential person, a movie called The Storm Foretold about oh, blanking on the guy's name. It's Roger Stone. He's like uh, someone who worked closely with with Trump, you basically follow a guy that gets to be alongside him on the day to day, and you just see like this weird person on screen, and um, the stuff that he gets, uh, that he just like is openly talking about is is fascinating to see. Although you obviously have disgust for that rancid, horrible person that that you see on screen. Uh, then another one uh, about Sohe, uh, really interesting um, uh, sort of Korean. Thriller, uh, and then my most anticipated movie of the year, Lachlan. I know we talked about this early in the year, right? We made that list. I think for you, what was all the way up there for you? Was it Napoleon? Or was it uh, The Killer was on your list, I remember? Um, I actually do not remember at this stage in my career. <laughs> well, for me, at least, it was The Boy and the Heron, and at that point, I wasn't even sure that it was going to come out in 2023. When we did this back in January. Um, and I'm a huge Hayao Miyazaki fan. I like Studio Ghibli a lot. Uh, this one left me a bit cold. I think it's still really good. But it, there was just something missing that really dragged me in into the protagonist's story. Or like it's visually, as always, very pleasant to watch. Even if it's like, it's definitely like not a children's movie. It, like the heron is a. <laughs> very much like uh, a creature that like morphs and is quite sometimes kind of scary to look at, uh, especially for younger audiences, I think. But go give it a watch for sure if you like Studio Ghibli, but it's not going to be one of the best ones. It's not going to be all the way up there with, with the greatest. But uh, those are the highlights. Again, we'll, uh, I'll, I'll, we'll be chatting a bit more about them once hopefully my you computer had, um, works. You had... This movie and Barbie as your match number one for most anticipated. Really? Okay, yeah. It's a, that would be an interesting double feature as well. We finished Ahsoka, a show that I've praised, I think, on last week, so two weeks ago uh, on the episode, uh, as being like the best thing uh, for Star Wars since the original trilogy. Having finished the series, I wouldn't say the same thing anymore, if I'm being honest. Lachlan, what about you? Where do you land on, on the, the series as old? Well? I I agree with where why I think you're going to say that. Um, I still think that it is the best Star Wars content involving a Jedi in a while, and I just I like to right <laughs> all of those a asterisks of, yeah mm -hmm. with the Jedi because while Andor is Star Wars, it was a completely different type of Star Wars piece yeah. of content, mm -hmm. um, which I liked. And I think is one of the best Star Wars content to come out in a while. But mm -hmm. Ahsoka doesn't give you a lot at the end, which is why I think you might be a little bit disappointed where it doesn't really give you much. Mm. But it is setting up quite a lot, the yeah. live action universe. Fair. For people who enjoy Star Wars, this is the, the stuff we've been waiting for to get in that live action. Mm. Um. But I want to hear what you think first. Like, why why you have taken back that comment? 
Well, I think in the previous six episodes, uh, I was okay with some of the Star Wars y dialogue that, that, that you get. In these last two episodes, I don't know, maybe it was because there was a bunch of time in between and I didn't binge a, a couple of them back to back. It was just a bit cringe to hear them talk because it was never uh, really about anything. It was always like, you could almost always tell whenever they said something at the end of the sentence, you could add a, a cheeky little smirk to it. And I was like, oh, this is something, uh, a remark to something, uh, maybe in the future, hint, hint. And it just like feels not within the stories like it makes me way less invested in the characters when i actually was really invested with like sabine's uh storyline and it, it's just like it spells it out to you as if you're the dumbest person that just is is, is kind of annoying what really carries it still is when there's fighting but i also thought the fighting was a like was weaker than in the previous six episodes so it was just like a, I don't know, it was just a bit, bit, bit weaker overall for me. But well, what about you? What, what was I it think for you? The, I think the combat was actually really fun to watch. Right. Um, I don't think it is as high of a level of a praise that I can give the, the, the prequels. Um, yeah. Because in terms of Star Wars combat, uh, the originals are quite slow when it comes to combat. The mm. prequels are god tier. And the sequels are like a hack and slash. Uh, they're just waving the lightsabers around. Mm -hmm. But for me, uh, I feel like Ahsoka's combat and, and Star Wars lightsaber fighting was, uh, was, was pretty decent. Maybe it's more the story thing, you know, that within these other fights, it felt like the resolution is probably not that heroes are going to die, but they could be injured. And in this... Now in this final fight, I didn't really feel like they were not capable to to do anything. I don't know. I I didn't feel like yeah. they were they were at risk, and it was like it didn't feel as tense to me. Um, the the choreo the choreography of the fighting, I feel like it's still like very it's it's like they they do a great job, but it's just I don't yeah. know the stakes. The issue went there. the issue is obviously that they had Sabine survive a, a lightsaber to the gut, which yeah. Sabine is not the first character in recent Star Wars history to survive a lightsaber to the gut, and Qui Gon Jinn also got a lightsaber to the gut, and he died like moments later. He died. So for me, the the issue I have with Star Wars is they're doing that still, where a lightsaber to the gut means death. Like that's that's the thing. Um, if they want us to not believe it, then give us a reason how they survived, uh, than just you know plot. Uh, um, what am I looking? What's the word I'm looking for here? Yeah. Don't give me a don't give me an excuse uh, as to why she survived. Yeah. Uh, if it's just plot armor, that's mm. all it's gonna be. It's just like, oh yeah, look, look at her. She's still around. She's still kicking. Where Qui Gon's dead, which sucks. But um, I don't I don't think Ahsoka's last two episodes dropped the ball that much. I just feel like they had to push a lot because there was a lot of ideas they were closing. Um, especially with the Mortis God stuff, especially with the, the World Between Worlds stuff uh, with, in the previous few episodes with Anakin. There's a lot of stuff they set up that's never been introduced in live-action Star Wars, which is a lot for mm. people who haven't seen the Clone Wars, which for Star Wars fans is surprising. But there are still a lot of people out there who haven't sat down and watched the animated stuff. And that's where the most world-building happens. Mm. Yeah, I'm talking to one of them right now. Um... Star Wars movies are great for fundamentally just entertainment. Mm -hmm. But if you want like Star Wars lore, you've got to sit down and watch like all eight seasons of uh, seven or eight seasons, eight seasons of the Clone Wars. Um, yeah, that's something. Rebels, like you got to watch. You got to watch. You got to watch all of them because they introduce a lot of stuff, which is super interesting. And if that's all now uh, canon, then Oh baby, that's the uh, that's the best part because now we get to see it in live action, and uh, I'm sure like have you've watched some of Clone Wars? No, not any of it. The only thing I watched was those uh, things that they released last year about Ahsoka. I don't know what uh, Tales of the Jedi is the only thing I saw. Which so, uh... so the the statue that uh, Lord Balon uh, was standing on at the end, right? Mm. What did you think? Oh, that's a cool wallpaper. I don't know. <laughs> cool. 
So there is a series of episodes in Clone Wars where Ahsoka, uh, Anakin, and uh, Obi Wan are stuck on a like a planet, right? Mm-hmm. And the the Mortis gods are a physical representation of the Force. The son, right, being uh, the dark side. The daughter being the light, and then the father being the balance. And without going into too much depth, essentially. This is where uh, Anakin discovered that he is the chosen one designed to bring balance to the force. He's meant to kind of replace the father. So for everyone who's seen this stuff, seeing Anakin in the world between worlds um, and in the same series that they introduced the Mortis gods makes them believe that he has replaced the father in that world now that he's dead he's replaced the father as, as that figure. Mm -hmm. And they're going to obviously play around with who's going to be the son and the daughter, yada, yada, yada. But there's also, uh, Abeloth, Abeloth. Yeah. I can't remember the exact pronunciation of her name. This part is, is really interesting where she was like this, I believe she was mortal. She served the gods. And then Mm -hmm. she, this is like real law, deep stuff where she went to like this river and she, bathed in the river and then she became a god herself okay and she became like the mother who if the father's the balance of the force she's the opposite of that so you basically have son daughter light and good the father the balance and then abeloth the fucking chaos god mm-hmm. and that's who lord balon's trying to find because she is like pure power that's the that's the oh. that's what everyone's trying to pick like is that what he's going for is that what he's looking for right um but if they're not going to do that, then like this is for people who haven't seen any of that stuff. It's kind of like, oh, OK, cool. There's these cool statues. They're pointing to something interesting. But for people who know about the, the Star Wars lore, dude, like it's getting exciting for live action Star Wars stuff. And there's no season two that's like greenlit. And that annoys yeah. me because if Disney decides to go, yeah, we're not going to do that, then dude, I, I, I want another two or three seasons of Ahsoka because... All of it is pretty much like fan service. And mm. for me, like that's something that I feel like Star Wars has been missing for a while. It's been trying to be taken in ways that are trying to expand the universe, but ruin older ideas to finally have a bit of Star Wars content that's really fundamentally forming some really cool ideas that have been shown in the animated series in live action. That's super exciting. Mm. Well, I'm definitely not gonna... that I don't want to see uh, unoriginal. I, I, I do want to see original Star Wars content. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I have gone on record for saying that as well, where I've been like, <laughs> I like Skywalker stuff. So the tapes. Other stuff in that universe, mm. right? Ro- play that clip back, whatever. Yeah, yeah. But like, I would love to see this in live action because that excites me. Mm-hmm. Well, I would still love to see original Star Wars stuff. <laughs> I feel like it's just another, uh, another reason to go see the series for for me then um because yeah it might have been that where it felt like it was just like nodding to the audience a bunch and i i was like i felt excluded i was like damn i don't know i don't know why is this why are you doing this right now um and i don't know if i would even like like you shouldn't you you shouldn't feel excluded man that's that's the issue like if if some groups are going to feel excluded then i don't think that's the best form of storytelling and now I'm, I feel like I'm blindsided because yeah. I was so ha- excited about what was happening on screen that I haven't looked yeah. at this objectively. Um, and I feel like if I, if I do, I can go back and rewatch Ahsoka from an objective, like creative control, how they made this standpoint, storytelling standpoint. And I have to admit, like, yes, some of that dialogue is trashy, but I was having so much fun seeing uh, like the, the night troopers and seeing the, the, the night sisters like I, mm. oh man, I like the entire run of Ahsoka's eight episodes was just so much fun, so mm. much fun. Yeah. But rewatch, watch all the Clone Wars, and then rewatch this, and then and Rebels, and then also rewatch all of Star Wars, and then prequels, sequels, uh, originals. Then you got to watch Rogue One. Then you've yeah. got to watch Solo. Then then you have to read all of the comic book lore that Disney scrapped. Uh, and then rewatch Ahsoka, then well, tell me what you think. I think I should also watch Akira Kurosawa's <laughs> the Hidden Fort- a Hidden Fortress. 
uh, just like to get to yep, the source yep. as well. Uh, and yeah, watch yeah. all the behind the scenes. Uh, buy every single edition of Star Wars and watch all of the Blu-ray extended features. Uh, in that disc as well. Watch it on VHS. Watch it on Laserdisc, like it originally was. Yeah. Watch it on every format you can. <laughs> then, and then rewatch Ahsoka, and then yeah. tell me what you think. I'll take my time. <laughs> I can do that before season two. Oh, and two the Christmas up. special. The Christmas special. <laughs> and I the Christmas special. I still haven't seen the Christmas special. I don't know if they have that on, on uh, Disney Plus or if they're hiding it, the, those car words. I think, I think it's actually on Disney Plus. Probably should be, right? But, um, I mean, yeah, I'm, I'm down to uh, get a season two. Hopefully, we'll get that. Um, and I think it just shows that they have a lot of care for the fans of this, uh, of this franchise who, who do really... Uh, care about those little um, bits that you give them and um, yeah it, it doesn't really take away from anything like you said like some of the sequels do I think it's overall a good thing for Star Wars and that's my review it's not on Disney Plus ah okay see typical censorship from Disney they also by the way we didn't do any news but Disney is also cracking down on password sharing similar to Netflix and, uh, yeah, you soon won't be able to share it across, uh, I guess, different people are living in different households, which isn't great. It's just like desperate money grabbing thing, I guess, when streaming services can't grow anymore uh, organically. Hey, what do you, what, do you think Disney's going to sell themselves to Apple? I think there's, it's, it's likely. I, I think they're trying to. What do you reckon would happen? Like what? What would well, you think? Well, in the UK, maybe it will get then? blocked, but no one else in the fucking states is giving a flying fuck. Yeah, yeah. Because the UK is blocking that stuff, but even with the what was it? I, I forget what companies were involved, but there was a huge thing in gaming recently where they blocked it in the UK, and then basically what happened is companies went like, "Well, why? H- how about you reconsider?" And then they did. <laughs> <laughs> they cut through. Uh, so I don't know what, what that would be like with the literal like biggest company in the world uh, acquiring yeah. one that's, I don't know how, uh, you, you could fit like a couple dozen Disneys, I think, in into Apple. But yeah, it could very well be the case. And I don't know if we would change anything. Maybe we would get better streaming quality uh, because it's under Apple. But yeah, I think for the consumer, it wouldn't change like a ton. Anyways, speaking of someone who doesn't change much, Wes Anderson, he likes one of one one style and he does it in all of his movies. And we get it in Ronald Ronald Vaughn. Ronald McDonald at McDonald's gives you the snackies that you want from Wes Anderson. Which Ronald are Doll? Doll, Doll. Yeah, I don't know why I'm struggling. I struggle with that name all the time. The short stories, The Wonderful Story of Henry Sugar, The Swan, The Red Catcher, and Poison are released over on Netflix. The first had a premiere in Venice, so I did get to see this in in a theater, uh, which was a bit of a different experience for a short film, uh, I gotta say, even though it is the longest one coming in at, I think, a 40-minute long runtime. We'll go through, I guess, collectively first and then one by one, but what do you think about this overall collection of short films? Obviously, they're individual, but you can look at the the collective as... Wes Anderson's uh, Ronald Dahl uh, short adaptation. Mm. And I think that uh, overall, like, they're okay. Uh, they're, they're very Wes Anderson-y. And to me, these are adaptations. And Ronald Dahl's films do work quite well with Anderson's style, in my opinion. I think that the, the way that he adapts them in this, in this case is fairly faithful. They don't really hold much back. And I think that the situations that these characters find themselves in is a situation that Wes would write for an original character and an original story. So for me, I think that the blending of the two styles of storytelling, Ronald Dole's story, and then Wes Anderson's visual way of telling things, even though most of the time it's said to the screen, it, it works well. And I think that from a visual appearance, it's fantastic. I guess over time you can get quite irritated with just characters monologuing to the screen. And I do admit that it does get tiring at times. But for me, especially with uh, the wonderful story of Henry Sugar, it, it, it's 
it's a well oiled machine. Like mm-hmm. character like if you break it down with what's happening on screen, actors have to say particular things at a certain time on a certain beat. And on that certain beat, 20 different objects in the background are going to be moving and flying in into screen into a shot. Yeah. It's a very well oiled machine. So mm-hmm. I have to appreciate how he's put this together and how much time it must have taken to really, first of all, learn the entire freaking script by heart. So shout out to, uh, I guess, because it's pretty much the same four or five actors in each uh, of the shorts Mm -hmm. who have to monologue over whether it's 40 minutes or 20 minutes, the entire thing and just read what's happening to the audience. So that's well done. But secondly, the entire production team for these shorts Wes Anderson has put together, even though it's Wes Anderson, it's not just him planning this. It's it's coming from his brain and then it's his first AD, second, third AD going to their production lines, telling the camera crew, here's what's going to happen, getting the grips to fucking light shit. Like, like they really have to work hard to get everything to look as good and basically perfect in each shot. So yeah. it, it has to be appreciated with how well each department has to work with each other to get something as visually pleasing as this. I think it is like incredibly smooth and the production design is, is definitely the standout as it is for most Wes Anderson films. I think some are better with character. Here, I could not distinguish between anyone because it is just monologuing. Um, and I didn't, I didn't care for it. I didn't, I didn't really like it, any of them, um, because that got really tiring to me. Like when I, know, when I realized sitting in the theater with a, with a couple hundred other people that it was just going to be the same thing over and over again to tell the story, I got really bored and couldn't really get through once I got back uh, the later few. I don't know. There was just something about it that I, that I didn't really care for, even if it's really visually not even visually stimulating but it's just like it's easy to look at the way that he just like weaves everything in and out but it makes me care less about the story that is actually told because it's so much more about the mechanics yeah like it's i don't know you look like at the intricacies uh of of like a well-oiled uh well-oiled like a the machinery of like a clock and you see the inner workings but you know you 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 look how it all moves but I don't know. It doesn't really tell you the time, though. Like, it's uh, this allegory doesn't make any sense. Never mind, scratch that. <laughs> I couldn't make it work. But it's just, I don't know. Something about it for me was just uh, not it. But maybe I just need you next to me when I watch Wes Anderson and you laugh. And then I'm like, good Wes Anderson movie. Because I don't know if I'd, if I'd like Asteroid City on a rewatch uh, by myself, you know? I don't know if I would like it the same amount. I think overall, uh, the best one of the four is Henry Sugar. Yeah, uh, yeah. Because it is the most captivating and complex and actually tells a story that does evolve, where with the Swan, Ratcatcher, and Poison, they're mostly sort of 20 minutes of just monologuing and no real real big arc. Um, My least favourite, of them all would probably be Ratcatcher. Uh, mm. I didn't really vibe with it that well. I just didn't find it that funny. Uh, but with the Swan, I found the situation to be quite dark and such a humorous light to be put upon it is, is, is to me at least funny. And then same with Poison, how they go through this entire ordeal and then there's no stake. And I found that again, quite funny. So for me, like, And then at the end of each of these, explaining where Ronald Dog basically got the idea for the story and Mm. then didn't write it until like 20 to 30 years later is also quite funny to me how it's like Ronald Dog wrote this idea in his book and then 40 years later actually wrote the story. So it just sat in his idea book for like 40 years. So like that's that's really interesting to me. So I guess uh, a lot of conversation has come to light recently with. Ronald Dole's stories and certain places changing what actually happens in the book. Uh, they're, they're essentially re-editing uh, his yeah. stories. And Wes Anderson has stayed pretty faithful with the original storytelling, keeping as much as he can in. Uh, and, and for me, that's, 
that's interesting how it's it's probably more of a um a statement than we probably think he's not just probably making these for shits and giggles like there is still a lot of money that has to go into making a 20 minute Wes Anderson film there's a lot of as we yeah, said yeah. complexities behind the scene with making something as visually straining as this so even, even if his actors to... don't really make money on it I think that's like one of the things that came out of Asteroid oh yeah it's yeah, like, yeah, yeah yeah we this is like to get that cast it will cost so much but they just do it because they like it which is yeah. uh... to be honest the film also isn't that deep when it comes to production design it, no, it's no. pretty much maybe three or four levels and then a painted background yeah it's yeah. a painted map background and that's pretty much yeah. all it is and it seems like wes anderson got together with you know uh who was in these films uh ralph fines benedict cumberbatch dev patel ben kingsley richard awade uh who else was in 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 these films um i mean that's pretty uh, much it and he got a bunch of child actors and that's it oh and rupert rupert friend like oh yeah it's like they all got together one weekend and were like do you guys want to make some short films? And they were like, yeah, let's do it. And they did it over a weekend and they all kind of like pitched in. And that's kind of how the film is, is made. Like yeah. some of them play stage, like literal characters named Stagehand are in the film and listed as like those actors. So mm. it's almost like they all got together and they tried making this uh, film, you know, these series of short films. Uh, and, and, and to me, that, that's kind of like the, the beauty of it is like eight friends get together and make four Ronald Dahl short films. Mm. But because it's Wes Anderson, it's like everyone's losing their mind on how visually stunning the film is. But yeah, like these were not great, but I have to kind of commend the the production team behind it to kind of get everything to to be what it is on screen. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I mean, lastly, I guess we could talk about uh, the format of it because initially, uh, you know, there were rumors that there's going to be two Wes Anderson films in 2023 and uh, I don't think Netflix did a great job promoting this. I think a lot of people were really surprised by just like, hey, there's four Wes Anderson shorts on the service now. Like knowing Wes Anderson and his style that sometimes he does like to use the framing around something else to tell a further story maybe you couldn't go one step further beyond into the inception hole that is Wes Anderson but do you think this was initially a feature film that featured like short short stories or was it always supposed to be separated well we obviously know that Wes loves uh breaking walls uh and the fourth is his favorite wall to break there is obviously a if you watch this in a random order, if you don't watch The Wonderful Story of Henry Sugar first, it does kind of not make sense uh, because there is that Ralph Fiennes character who's writing these stories, who I, who I guess is meant to be. I can't remember who he's meant to be because I watched these like a week ago. It's not. Um, it's yeah, Ronald Dalt, basically. And, I don't know. Well, well, I don't know who he's meant to play, but he, he's writing an author. Yeah, and that's yeah. the one character who links each of these stories together. So if we take something like Asteroid City, where you have, uh, I was about to say, <laughs> I was about to say Walter White. Um, <laughs> it's just so it's just so fundamentally put into my brain that Brian Cranston is Walter White that I just think that his name is Walter White. Um, you have yeah. Brian Cranston linking those stories together in the French Dispatch. You have uh, the the main. Uh, news team uh, linking all those stories together in uh, Grand Budapest. It bas basically is written as a as a story from a perspective of a character, and that mm -hmm. links the story together. That breaks that fourth wall. So th there always is that character in his films, and and that's who that elderly uh, Ralph Fiennes character that he plays is. Mm -hmm. I could see this being one, you know, hour and a half long. Uh, 90 minute long thing but as we've said with anderson's films he's better with doing one narrative than multiple french dispatch proves that where he is not as capable of stringing together a strong story narratively if he links all of these little stories under the one big one so with asteroid city he got rid of that he did a single narrative and I feel like he still wants to investigate that kind of multi-narrative 
storytelling under the one main narrative, and that's kind of this. He's he's kind of playing around with the format a little bit. I would love to see, he, hear me out, a Wes Anderson TV show. Eight, eight six, eight episodes of a of a book. Let's just do the Bible, for example. <laughs> right. Start with Genesis, but Wes Anderson adapted. Yeah. Come on, come on. There's plenty of books in the Bible for him to adapt, and he could have like you know. Yeah. I don't, part one. I, I think for his style, it Old works. Old Testament. But uh, I don't know. It's just I, I don't think that this uh, monologuing thing works for me. Um, even if it's with his style, but I'm sure I'm sure a lot of people do yeah. uh, enjoy that. Uh, I don't know if this I didn't is like. like it. I don't know if I would present this to like. It's a kid story to like you know show this to kids and have them enjoy it. It doesn't feel like it's made for the kids. You know, it's not for the kids. This one's for us. No, for the film lovers of Wes Anderson. Uh, yeah, I don't, I don't really have much else to add, to be honest. Um, Which isn't new, by the way. You, you aren't a film lover <laughs> of Wes Anderson. Y- yes, I am a bit of a hater, which is why we got you, because you balance uh, the two of us out. Yeah. If you like yeah. Wes Anderson, uh, go give them a try. And uh, yeah, they're on Netflix, so should be available for pretty much everyone. All right, Lachlan, are you ready to get to the main review? The, the movie we're really excited to talk about, and we only have positive things to say <laughs> uh, about The Exorcist yes. Believer from David Gordon Green. Now, Lachlan, could you read us the logline for the movie? Of course. It's my first go reading this, and I'm not going to fuck it up. It's a Watch long me go. <clears throat> it literally is. It's like a whole paragraph. Since the death of his wife 12 years ago, Victor Fielding has raised their daughter, Angela, on his own. But when Angela and her friend Catherine disappear in the woods, only to return three days later with no memory of what happened to them, it unleashes a chain of events that will force Victor to confront Nadia of evil and in his terror and desperation, seek out the only person alive who has witnessed anything like it before. Chris McNeil. Talk about a misleading logline. Well, this would be... Nadia. I don't know what Nadia is. Sounds like a, a Middle Eastern name. The lowest and most unsuccessful point in a situation. Interesting. Nadia of evil. We're forced to confront a Nadia of... Okay, so it's just really bad. And you could also say it's like from hell, maybe. I don't know. That's where the devil comes yeah. from. That... Am I pronouncing it correctly? Uh, the devil that possesses, maybe. I think, them. I don't know. Uh, I watched I watched uh, The Exorcist uh, for the first time this year, like in my life. I had never seen it before. Um, in kind of preparation for this, you too, or what about you? Lachlan? Yeah, you, you already. I haven't seen The Exorcist. What? You? <laughs> That's actually really funny. <laughs> that he's seen The Exorcist, believer, like the fifth movie or whatever in this franchise, but not the original. Yeah, I, I don't know. I haven't seen The Exorcist. Uh, it's just one that always has me pass me by. What's your excuse? I mean, I've now caught up with it, but only recently. Uh, it's just like not. Well, thing. you know this. I'm not a big horror guy. I don't. Yeah. I'm. I'm not going to. If someone. Okay. So when did? Okay. The Exorcist. Let me. What year did The Exorcist come out? Uh, Seventy-three. 70, oh fuck! I would have said seventy-seven. Top movies from nineteen seventy-three. Okay. So if I had to go back in time and, oh, sorry, we'll not go back in time. But if someone said, hey, I need you to uh, rewatch uh, a movie from 1973, right? There's The Exorcist. But uh, I've seen The Sting, which yeah. I think is a, is, a, is, a, is a better film to see than The Exorcist, most likely. Um, <laughs> Gonna piss uh, off the I've Britain seen fans. Enter the Dragon. Yeah. What else have I seen he, in 1973? He's seen movies, everyone. He just hasn't seen The Exorcist. Well... For you the going in. The animated Robin Hood movie. So good. The Holy Mountain. I've seen that. Yeah. Oh, that's uh, a crazy Fantastic one to Fantastic Planet. See. I haven't seen that. I have but, seen that uh, one. But I haven't seen, I haven't seen The Exorcist. And, and that's just because I don't seek out horror films to watch. Uh, I only watch them when, A, maybe in Halloween season. It's the spooky season. Mm. Um. And when I hear they're like really solid recent ones, I haven't really been into horror until recently. So yeah. I don't actively seek out horror films and I just haven't seen The Exorcist. But, but I have a question. I have a question. Oh, it's got a question. Yeah. Would you say The Exorcist is worth seeing in 4K? Because I've noticed that it's just come out 
in 4K DVD. Yes, I, I would say so. There's a bunch of like really great looking shots, like that iconic thing that always gets used as as the, the backdrop, where like the the preacher is coming to the house. It's mm. a it's a well shot movie. It's not like sorry, it's not like has it doesn't have crazy visuals or anything. Yeah. Um, and hopefully it's a good version, a good 4K print. But um, yeah, I, I, would, I would get it. I'll, get, it. I'll get the 4K then, and I shall watch it in 4K. Sweet. Yeah, I mean, now that... What did you uh, rate it? That's what I should... That's what I really should be basing this off of. If you gave it like a shit score, I'm not going to watch it. You gave it a four and a half. I gave it a four and a half. I don't remember doing that. That's you said just... bloody brilliant four and a half. All right, cool. Well, it looks like I'm gonna go watch it. Uh, I'm gonna get it on 4K. It's like it's it, there's something about the this the the old school movie making in this that feels similar to, similar to like what makes Texas Chainsaw uh, the original uh, Te- Texas Chainsaw Massacre so great, where everything feels so gritty and grim, and you don't actually know where it's going. Like the stereotypes for the genre haven't been laid out and spelled out for everyone to understand and i feel like that's where a lot of like the modern franchises in horror so su- like that's what they suffer from they always have to acknowledge what has come before and you don't get that with the earlier ones you just have someone like fritchkin who wants to tell like this uh pretty grim story and here paired with david gordon green who is someone who likes to showcase the grim stuff like i think that was what I like a lot of people hated the second uh, uh, Halloween film that he did, Halloween Kills, but I enjoyed that one quite a bit. Although it had did have that like um, the uh, town to get a strong kind of narrative, uh, I liked how gruesome it was. Just like focusing on Michael's kills the whole time. I think it doesn't really work as well with the Exorcist franchise because you can't mm-hmm. really do that because you end up doing it mostly to young. Uh, children in this year where they have to play the possessed and it's kind of like taking a toll on them and then it also has to ride on the performances that they give which I, I think are fine but it's just like it's a hard thing to sell this and uh you know Regan in the original which I think is yeah we, we do get I guess it is spoiled that Regan returns she is incredible in that role it might be like up there as top three best child performances of all time i'd say it's really good and it's just a hard standard to live up to and i feel like if you look at the reception so far like i got to this at a private screening for universal early on no one had seen it before and i went in maybe i I was just like i was pampered no i was just trying to say like i was maybe i was pampered a bit because coming out of it i didn't i didn't hate this one i didn't hate believer i thought it like left a lot of potential on uh the table where it just kind of took the boring way out i didn't like the ensemble cast uh that was kind of forced into working together where i was really invested in our lead character here with because i'm a i'm a huge fan of uh leslie autumn jr i think he's great but his character is just kind of not given enough room to for me to actually care for it and as you can see in the ratings, like it's a 2.3 on Letterbox. Like people are absolutely hating it over there. A 5.2 on IMDb and then a uh, 39 on Metacritic. And uh, I mean, I came in initially with like a, a 6 out of 10 for this one. Um, and maybe I just got to rethink it a bit. I was, I guess, a bit forgiving. And that's uh, in, the, in, the, in the name of the Lord, I was being forgiving. And, uh, but maybe I need to repent and, and adjust my, my uh, rating. But Lachlan, what about you didn't, didn't work for The Exorcist Believer? Because I think you, you didn't like it uh, like at all, right? Well, saying I didn't like it at all is probably a bit harsher than what bit I harsh? actually say. Mm-hmm. I would say that I feel like as a film, it's okay. Like, mm-hmm. I feel like there is a, a decent amount to the film. I think getting halfway through, it, it gets a little bit iffy. Um, it gets very preachy about church, uh, which right. was a, a, a point they really riled home for a good, like, 10, 15, 20 minutes of, like, church brings people together, and that's what's more important than an exorcism is, is the community of what church does. And they kept riding that, and I was like, can we just 
go away from that because while I haven't seen The Exorcist and its sequel, I know and I have seen a series of clips from The Exorcist. It's a very famous movie. I've read a lot about it with like the horror of what happened behind the scenes. Mm -hmm. So I kind of have a gist of what The Exorcist is. So from a from a viewer who has not seen the original Exorcist, for me, I thought The Exorcist was going to be more of a conversation piece between mm -hmm. the devil and the rest of the, 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 the group. Because I do believe that in the original Exorcist, there's a lot of conversation between the, the possessed girl and the priests, right? Why yeah. are you in this body? Who, why are you doing this? And I'm going to assume because there's sequels, uh, it becomes less and less because it's kind of the same reason each time, right? I'm a piece of shit demon. I'm going to possess this little person. You have to select, uh, you know, you're going to save me. You're not going to save this girl, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. For me, this film did not have enough of that. It had some of the demon uh, bullying is the easiest way I can put it, where she uh, starts screaming it down how the uh, nurse is a whore and, you know, killed her own child of God. And that was like, that was probably the exciting part. But then they, they don't lay on anybody else. They just mm -hmm. hold their hands back and not bully anybody else. And I thought this is the best part of the exorcist in my opinion is, you know, them like the, the demon playing around with, the the minds and the insights because it knows what these people have done they seem like good people on the in on the outside but really they're suffering on the inside and that to me is what this film could have been yeah but it doesn't do that it takes a very long time to get into the possessions and i thought that as an opener it was pretty good like it really set it up to be like okay this is interesting but then mm. as soon as you get the kind of the first possession it it just dies. The film just dies and it, it doesn't really hold you in on that anymore. So yeah. for me, the, the biggest issue is that the exorcist, well, sorry, I don't know how to explain it, but like the, the demon is not that in exciting. Like it's yeah. not that exciting of a villain. Um, and it tries to go for the, the theatrics of the exorcism more than what is interesting about this particular horror is the, the, looking in on your own life that's the horror of these of these films right i mean that's what i was hoping for uh because this is a, a spoiler review by the way if you uh haven't seen it here's your your final warning but uh, with leslie odium jr and his, his daughter the, the stakes there are that he didn't actually want her wanted her uh he didn't want her he uh, was choosing his wife over him and then twist of fate I don't know. Uh, I don't know what was implied there. If someone made the decision for her or if, I don't know, one of the other just survived. I I was a bit, I don't know, I was kind of confused. Maybe that's just like my demented mind not working anymore, like uh, two weeks after seeing the film. But it's just like the editing in this film is also like very much in your face. There's, it's, it's a bit too mm. much at times, but... I do agree. I think the opening is by far the strongest point of the story. And until they get back, I was actually really invested in it because I like the dynamics between the parents who don't like each other but have to work together. Like it gave me, this is the biggest compliment I can give this, this film. It gave me like early prisoners vibes and it just like never followed through on, on any of that. But like for a miss missing child movie, I think it's pretty good. For a possession horror film within the Exorcist uh, franchise, it's probably pretty bad. But I was just like so high still on like the, I don't know how, how, how uh, scary it kind of was, like the opening of them just going missing. And I don't really know where it's going other than, well, it, probably one of them is going to be possessed or maybe one of them dies. I don't know. And then it just like was so insistent on making every single character kind of matter in a way where... It just like it it couldn't it couldn't juggle this many characters and it didn't need them and I think it also wanted to make the point that like this one is is the one where the church can't even go that far because like the 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 guy who comes in is first doesn't have the okay from the church then doesn't come in comes in immediately dies so it, like it feels like an odd fourth 
kind of fourth wall breaking way of saying like, hey, the stakes have, have risen. I don't know. Because like, you know, the guy who was initially able to solve this is not someone who can solve it. Yeah. And, and it wants to come back to like, it's going to be all personal at the end. But then it packs in that twist of like the father choosing uh, his, his daughter's life over the others. And then that daughter dies, which I thought was, was an interesting choice. I think they don't really yeah. do enough with the aftermath of that. <laughs> you just like kind of yeah. glance over it in a way. Um, and it's just like they, they do want that final shot between Regan and her mom at the end. Uh, and it's just that's not that's not what we in for in this movie. I feel like we're invested in other stuff. Yeah, I think that I do agree on the on the person you want to live idea because that was exciting. That was the only exciting part of the exorcism is when they are like one girl will live, one girl will die, and that was an interesting dilemma to have. Like, well, what do we do here? Do we, do we give in? Do we try to fix it? Or do we just pick one? And you've obviously got a, a desperate mother who wants to save her daughter. You've got a father whose only family is this girl. Um, and even mm -hmm. he doesn't want to pick. Like, he, 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 he's such a good bloke that he doesn't want to pick his daughter and kill another innocent child. It was like, it was, it's got a lot of angles that are, that are quite interesting. And then to have obviously the dad run in and say, he picks his daughter. Everyone freaks out. He's trying to say like, it, it's a very interesting uh, idea that I wish was played into more. Um, mm. Because again, you said it. And then all of a sudden we're cutting back to seeing the uh, previous characters come back and, some sort of resolution, which to me, I, I knew that they were from previous movies. I didn't care. I mean, I don't having, care. having seen the film, I, I didn't care either. It was, I feel like it was such it's a, a terrible way let to it, use let it. Let it be rebooted. Yeah. Um, like yeah. have her be the person who writes the book. That's cool. Let her be famous. Let her not be talking to her daughter because of reasons, right? Don't you, I mean, come on, who's going to bring an old lady to do an exorcism and then she immediately gets her eyes stabbed out? And I was yeah. just like, you are stupid. You are so stupid. Um, I don't think you're a smart character at all. And I can't wait to see how smart your actual character is in the original films. Uh, and then find out how stupid you're written in this one. Well, I don't know if, if, if she has a ton more to say because in that original, she's... Like what she says here, she's not allowed in the room, right? When this stuff is happening. So she oh, actually... Oh, because patriarchy. Yes. That was yeah. a good line. Did, <laughs> I, I, I did funny. like... Yes. Uh-huh. My most anticipated film of 2023 was Barbie. Yes. Done with the patriarchy. You know, it's just like a lot of that stuff. Just It obviously wants to honor that character and the legacy and also bank on, on the money that it's going to generate because people are like... That person I do know because she's back and she was in a movie 50 years ago. Yeah, I don't know. It just, uh, it doesn't come together well. Do we have anything else to say other than, I think the possession yes. scenes are pretty good. They're decent. But what, what yeah. yeah. They're right. They're what's right. better, what's better is that you talk about how the editing is in your face. You didn't like it? Yeah, yeah. Um, no. What was, about, well, what about, kind of up and down. What about the one scene? where they do the examination once they're found. Because that was anxiety-driven for me, with how quickly the cuts were going in between different swabs and photos. I actually thought, yeah. and, and that there was the kind of the film's peak for me. The film was actually doing really well. And then it peaked, and I was like, this is really well done, because it's making me anxious about how this is going down for these very young girls. And, I, and, and yeah. that is perfect storytelling if you can feel the same emotion a character's telling from something like editing as a great example and these quick cuts and and a lot of foley sounds as well where it's very much like the swab of the the saliva is very wet sounding and it just yeah. makes you uncomfortable like it's a lot of touching and showing parts of the body and and then like the dad's uncomfortable so he's gonna leave and then it's obviously the the like uh vaginal inspection like it, it gets it gets really in depth and you get really uh, like uncomfortable and, and and anxious about it that was yeah. perfect that's everything yeah, after that good what the hell like like, like I it said, was like once, the once best back, editing scene back, and then good. nothing 
Yeah. Uh, I, I think I think it's more like the the linear editing that I'm that I didn't like, where you jump from moment to moment, where like individual scenes that were kind of elevated through the horror, uh, through the editing, were done quite well at times, but then. To bring it all together, like that whole thing was to me a mess in the editing. Yeah. But yeah, I think that's that's all the I gotta other say. Praise, yeah. Sorry, you want to praise, praise one more thing? Is uh, Leslie Odom Jr. Uh, the lead? I think does a He's pretty sweet. decent job uh, yeah. carrying you through the film. Um, because he he he's your solid he's your solid rock. He's our protag, and I think he does wonders with a pretty mediocre. Not given dialogue much. written script yeah. but what he does it, he, he gives a lot um mm. and as somebody who is also in a relationship where when you go somewhere the boyfriend or the husband has a camera and uh just always wants to get the shot uh mm. i appreciated uh his wife's patience because it it's very much a is similar thing in my relationship. Well, like, I, well I hope the building doesn't the shot, crush on please. Tanika then. Yes. So <laughs> we're now doing 2%. an exclusive no earthquake fault line holiday trips yeah. anywhere. Mm -hmm. um, not going to Japan. <laughs> we're not doing anywhere. that. Yeah. But All I right. think I think we both found it quite funny how how similar that was when he's talking about like I just want to go get the shot. And then she's like, go get the shot. It's okay, well, baby. And I was like, yeah, that's me. I would be the one who's like, you don't let me go up there and take the photo. <laughs> yeah, the, the the updated version of like, would you still love me if I was a war, uh, worm? It is like, hey, would you would you save me or, or our child? <laughs> it's like, it's got to cause a bunch of... Would you still love me if I was a photographer? <laughs> <laughs> no, get out of there. He shoots no. on film. Yeah, oh my God, there. run. Um, yeah. yeah. But yeah, uh, some good times to be had. I think in this film, there's good moments. I don't know if I should stay on my three out of five rating. I think I should definitely, I don't know, thinking about it more uh, and the criticisms that I've, that I've heard since. I think I'm going just with a, with a two and a half out of five for this one. What about you, Uh So I gave the film a two because overall, <laughs> like I think the film is fine. It's just that the elements that the film is there to present, like the exorcist elements, aren't really there. Like, the exorcism, yeah. it's not that interesting to me. The The actual demon, there was not enough conversation with them to see why they want to fuck around. And if they just want to fuck around, we'll let them do that because the most exciting part of, like, a, a possession, especially from the clips that I can see, is when the demon knows what's happening inside someone's life and is poking fun of that. Like, let the demon have that fun because when you have a, a, a young girl and it's got the voice of, like, I don't know, uh, Mufasa, right? Because uh, mm. it's such a deep, dark voice and powerful. It's like, that's exciting for me. So I, I wish I had more of that. I wish I could have had more uh, that this film could have given to us uh, because yeah. it starts strong, ends up being quite weak. But at least it held me through with pretty okay filmmaking. I think the, the overall filmmaking is, is perfectly fine. Um, nothing jumps out to me as excellent. Nothing jumps out to me as great. It's just solid, does the job. It just doesn't do elements to a level that it should be at for that, right? Mm. Halloween gets more and more violent, but The Exorcist didn't. It just kind of stayed at one level. So for me, two stars. All right. Thank you for your rating there. And uh, if you had to pair this up with another film, what would you pick? So there's not a lot of like possession films that I could think of. Um, but there, I guess, well, there is one, which I think is, is a, an interesting segue into the horror space. And it's a little bit more of a different style of horror. It's, it's a Brandon Cronenberg film called Possessor, which I didn't mind. I gave it three stars out of five. Um, it's, it's a 3.6 star rated film on Letterboxd and it's, it's very interesting, uh, it's not about possession at all, but it, it is a, uh, it is an uncomfortable time. So mm. if you want something that will make you uncomfortable and queasy, it's a Cronenberg film. So strap yourself in because it will be that. Exactly. Then uh, my pick is going to be for those who ha haven't seen the original The Exorcist, but have seen the sequel. It's weird. You listen to this whole review. 
Go watch The Exorcist if you haven't. But if you have already, uh, less okay. a conventionally regarded possession film, but I guess it technically still is, but also is a creature film, uh, is John Carpenter's The Thing. Um, so that's going to be my recommendation uh, for the week. Uh, new releases this week. This movie, if you remember, moved up a week because of the one and only Taylor Swift and her movies The, Era, uh, the Eras Tour. Uh, that's going to be playing in theaters, in some theaters. I, I don't think it's playing here for me, but hey, if you, if you want to go see Taylor Swift, th there's your chance. Go get it. Also out in limited release and uh, with our seal of recommendation is Anatomy of a Fall, uh, out in limited release in the States. And for a lot of these festival films, uh, they are going to get releases over the next couple of weeks, and we obviously can't track them all, but uh, have a look out uh, in your local theater chains. They might be showing them. And some of them, you know, you might have to wait until like early next year until they do get released. Uh, but if they're out on VOD, we'll try to highlight that as well. Um, but that's actually the case for the movie that we're talking about, that we're talking about next week. Uh, premiered at the Zurich Film Festival. I talked about it last week. Fair Play. It's now already streaming on Netflix and we'll be talking about that. Maybe I even get Lachlan to watch the last uh, Fritkin film, the director of The Exorcist, with the Kane Mutiny Kurt Marshall. That's another one that's already streaming. Uh, Kevin and I, a couple weeks back, with a, a Venice, film, a Venice Film Festival recap, already uh, praised that one. We liked it quite a bit. So I think that's streaming on Paramount or Peacock or whatever those one, one of those P streaming services that no one has. Um, it's a bit of a... I'd say, dare I say, disgrace that this one is not coming to theaters and it's just going to streaming straight away, at least internationally. I think it does have a very limited run in the States. But um, yeah, another recommendation for the week. And uh, I'll definitely bring it up next week again. But in the meantime, uh, make sure to follow us on, on Letterboxd and our social media. Uh, leave a like and subscribe on the YouTube and leave us a rating over on Apple Podcasts and Spotify. It helps us get to these festivals that we like to go to very much again next week we talk about fair play later this week we'll have a recap for the zurich film festival and then kevin um who you might know from the uh, venice recap is going to the ghent film festival and in about two weeks time we'll have a recap from there so lots going on on the channel lachlan i hope you're doing better soon uh how long does your hay fever season like last in, in for you usually like how long do you usually it. It's so a it's taken a while to kick in. If I'm totally honest, when I was driving home uh, yesterday, there was a ton of flowers blooming. So I think that's kind of yeah. what's set it off. Uh, because in Australia, if you don't know, uh, at least in Western Australia, there's a lot of open spaces in a lot of metro-based areas of like parks yeah. and like national parks and forests. And I'm near one of those and there was Flex. a ton of flowers blooming. Like it was, yeah. instead of just being green or, or like burnt grass, like it is in summer, it was yellow and it was just flowers. So I could, I could like feel like, even though I had my, my windows up, aircon blasting in a loop, so I didn't get anything coming into my car. I could like feel my nose blowing up, but uh, I'm trying out a new nasal spray. And then right now I've actually got some sort of breathing in my nostrils. I'm not breathing through my mouth like a mouth breather. So uh, I'm getting there. Very We're cool. going to see. It's a seven-day run. And in seven days, if I don't sound better, then uh, I've been lied to by a pharmacist. Yeah. Uh, lied to about the, the yellow stuff. It's not getting any better. Uh, well, I really hope... I know you struggled with it when you were here in, in Switzerland, so I do hope... Um, yeah, I, I yeah, know how, I how bad it is. Yeah, two hay fever seasons oh this God. year. This sucks. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> He's been going through it. Um, but yeah, we'll be back next week, hopefully. And um, yeah, we'll talk to you then. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.